If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, Murder Sheet listeners. This is Anya Kane. And Kevin Greenlee. And we're the Murder Sheet. We've taken you on a nine-part look into the Burger Chef murders as part of our mini-series, You Never Can Forget. This week, we'll be doing something a bit outside the norm for us. Instead of doing one of our typical scripted shows, we'll be tackling listener questions for a Q&A episode. To do this, we turn to our talented friend, Matt Cassane. He's an actor, comedian, YouTuber, and podcaster. And he does a spot-on Tom Brokaw impression to boot. We've linked to his information in our show notes. What's more, he's also interested in true crime, and he fell down the Burger Chef rabbit hole a while back. In this episode, he'll be asking us some questions that listeners like you sent in. Thanks to everyone who reached out to us with your insightful questions. And just know that while this is going to be the last episode of our miniseries, You Never Can Forget... For now, we're not going away on the Burger Chef case. We'll still be looking into it behind the scenes, and we won't hesitate to put together a new episode of You Never Can Forget if we have any updates to share. And please stay tuned for what's next for the Murder Sheet. Next Tuesday, we'll start covering a different restaurant homicide every week. The crimes we'll cover are haunting, with baffling cold cases, terrifying mass murders, and even potential wrongful convictions all in the spotlight. We'll run a Crime of the Week format until we release our next mini-series in a few months. We can't say much about that case yet, aside from the fact it's as mind-boggling as Burger Chef and may involve a wrongful conviction. Please, if there are any questions we didn't get to or any tips you'd like to share with us, reach out to us at murdersheet at gmail.com. And enjoy the show! We're the Murder Sheet, and this is You Never Can Forget, The Questions, with Matt Cassane.
So this is Matt Kassane, and we're here with the uh, co-host of The Murder Sheet, uh, Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee. I got them right. Woo! Yeah, there you go. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Flying solo, no producer here, no no cue cards, no teleprompters, no ear prompters. So uh, we have a, a series of questions that we're going to ask uh, Anya and Kevin uh, about their uh, Burger Chef series that they're that you guys just wrapped up, right? You just did your, your final one? Yes, that's exactly right. I'm bummed out. I got to be honest with you, because every Monday night around uh, 11 or 12, I actually like uh, kind of go through uh, Google and look through, look uh, all the uh, uploads that you guys have had and um, try to find it. and. Uh, so uh, I've been looking forward to the new the new additions every uh, every Monday night, uh, Tuesday morning. So I'm kind of bummed out that we're having uh, a little bit of closure here, but uh, we'll get through it. All right. So here's our first question. I'm just going to uh, go right down the list here. What made you guys choose Burger Chef, the Burger Chef case, as a as a subject of your first podcast? I think that's your question, Kevin, because you were the one. Who, Kevin got into Burger Chef before I did. Okay. I, I saw on television uh, a few years ago an interview with Teresa Jeffries, who's the sister of one of the victims, and it really touched my heart. Uh, I had some memory of this case from back when I was a child when it first happened, and I'd always assumed mm -hmm. it had been solved. And when I realized it hadn't been solved, I just kind of got interested in it. I started doing a little bit of reading, and the next thing I knew, I was uh, down the rabbit hole. And okay. And what I got in, I got into it because I was looking into fast food crimes and I realized really quickly that this was a very complicated case with a lot of different theories and a lot of uh, very puzzling aspects to it. So I was like, okay, I want to, I want to look into this. And then that's how I met Kevin on newspapers.com. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Cause you guys don't you get, uh, Kevin, you're from Indiana mm -hmm. and I know Anya, you're from, uh, you're, you're out of New York, right? That's right. Are we are we allowed to ask you guys where you're where you're at right now? <laughs> Secret. No, uh, we're in Brooklyn. We're in uh, Fort Greene, Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, we're. Wow. we actually fell in love uh, over this case, and uh, so, so now we're living together. Now we're in living together. That's what. Uh, that's that's why we're in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> he was just in town. Um, but yeah, so we. Uh, yeah, we. This is how we met. It's kind of a weird couple meeting story, but. It's ours. I think it's on brand for both of us. <laughs> it's kind of strange. <laughs> but, you know, you guys, you guys make a great couple. Congratulations. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. This it, people uh, who I know when I tell them I met somebody looking into a cold case, they're like, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think uh, we w with Burger Chef, I think why we got so into this is it's such a it's such a unique case in so many respects. But there's such a human mm -hmm. heart to it because you have. Uh, for young people who are doing what so many American teens and young people do, which is work in fast food. And they're yeah. minding their own business, closing up a restaurant, and they go missing, and they are found dead, and nobody has been held to account for it. So it's like a puzzle, but it's also like the stakes are really high because you have these kids who lost their lives for no reason. Whatever, whatever the motive was, there was no conceivable reason to do this to a bunch of, you know, young teenagers and oh no things you know that, yeah and, and, and it's the sort of case where the more you look into it the more strange details and the more mysteries within a mysteries you you uncover so once you get hooked on it it stays with you yes yeah it really i think that was i mean i'm glad we picked as our title you never can forget because i feel like once people get into this and i think you matt had this experience you, you know you kind of it it kind of has its hooks in you to a certain extent and you're like i can't I can't let this go. I want to know what happened. And uh, so we have answers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like I, like I told you guys, uh, when I, when I stumbled upon the video on YouTube a few months ago, I was kind of like, wow, what's that all about? And I, I, I'm, I'm happy I did, but I'm also a little bit regretful because it consumed a large part of my life, but well, we were all quarantined. So it was, I guess, a good thing. So exactly. But um, now uh, another question that uh, you guys have had from your listeners, um, they were wondering if the murderer was ever caught. Yes. Good question. No, <laughs> no one has ever been uh, arrested or prosecuted or convicted for this crime ever. So it is a it is a unsolved uh, murder case. That is a, that is okay. a confusing aspect, though, because there's there's been so many uh 
suspects that I think a lot of people like Kevin when he was a kid assumed, ah, oh, they probably solved that. I saw it all over the paper. Sure. And, and so, uh, you so many law, okay. yeah, so many law officers would say, well, we know who did it. We know who did it. It was Donald Forrester or was this person or this person. And that just yeah. creates a lot of uh, confusion. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a very complicated case and very frustrating, I'm sure for you guys. Um, for everybody, uh, can you tell us more about the victims in the case? There were four victims. Yes. Uh, so there are four victims. Um, three of them were teenagers and then one of them was 20. So very young, very young group of victims. Uh, the manager, the assistant manager of the Speedway Burger Chef and one of the victims was Jane Freed. She was 20 years old. Uh, she was actually from Terre Haute originally, but uh, her family had moved to Avon, which is in the Indianapolis area on the west side. And uh, from what we can tell, talking to people who knew her, she was very kind of like neat and she was very excited about her career at Burger Chef. She kind of saw that as a way to sort of rise up the ranks uh, within a fast food company. Um, and she was kind of just adjusting to her new leadership role as a very young woman trying to figure out what that was basically like. But she, you know, we learned details about her. She's great with kids and, and you know, seemed like a, a woman who was kind of like figuring herself out at this time um sure and then kevin's um client teresa her sister ruth was another one of the victims do you want to talk about ruth uh ruth was uh kind of quiet she was very creative she was interested in computers that's something she wanted to pursue with her life so she would have gotten in on the ground floor since this was 1978 uh she had formerly worked at uh, a donut place that was right next door to the burger chef she, she switched over to Burger Chef because they offered her a little bit more money. Uh, she was unhappy at Burger Chef and wanted to go back to the Dunkin' Donuts. And they uh, Burger Chef persuaded her to hang out, hang out or on just a little bit longer. And that uh, turned out to be the wrong choice. Yeah. Um, Danny Davis was another one of the teens. He just started working at Burger Chef. And um, according to his mom, he hadn't even received his first paycheck there um, by a but by when he was when he was kidnapped and murdered, unfortunately. But he, uh, we can tell from like his yearbooks, he was in a lot of clubs. Uh, he was avid about photography and wanted to join the Air Force. Um, so you know he had these aspirations. Um, and then the uh, the last victim was Mark Flemons. Um, he was the youngest. He was also the only African American <coughs> victim. Um, and he was actually the only one who was also from Speedway. Uh, he went to Speedway High School. His family had moved to Speedway from Indianapolis. Um, they were confronted with some racism within the community, we've learned. And so it was a bit of an adjustment. Uh, but he, by all accounts, was very gregarious, very funny, kind of a kind of a cool guy to be around from what we've heard from people who knew him. So it's like, it's so important to remember that there are all these kind of like interesting um young people at the center of this and and it's it's so it's so sad to learn about them and and sort of learn about their personalities and learn about them coming into their own and to know that unfortunately somebody took their lives and they weren't really allowed to grow up and you know become the people who they were meant to be sure now i want to uh, just skip uh, a few questions um and just uh, ask you guys um, the Burger Chef restaurant is in uh, Speedway, Indiana, which is like a suburb of Indianapolis. And Kevin, you're from there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you guys actually went there. You told me the story when I when I interviewed you originally on my podcast. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty amazing kind of almost creepy story about you guys going to the actual physical building, which is still standing. It's it's dilapidated. It's pretty much nothing anymore. Uh, it's been several things since Burger Chef went out of business. Um, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that story <laughs> about uh, going in the back and the door that that still to me, I still think about that all the time. Like, holy crap. <laughs> it sounds like we're like trying to audition for like ghost hunters or something. Like, <laughs> it, <laughs> it's basically so it was one of the first things we did. Uh, not not quite the first thing and not the first day we had been working together, but we went to the Burger Chef, which to paint the picture is this uh, empty, uh, shuttered up building in Speedway, Indiana. It's right next to a tobacco shop and an auto parts store, I think. And mm -hmm. we were just walking around and Kevin was kind of pointing out various details of like, okay, here, you know, here's where the drive-through was. Here's where the sign would have been. And then yeah. 
I think I said something that uh, has proved infamous in this in this retelling. <laughs> Anya pointed to the back of the building and she said, oh, is that the door that was famously left open on the night of the murders? And before yeah. I could answer, a little gust of wind came by and blew the door open. <laughs> so we were both just like, oh my God. And <laughs> and we, uh, we were like, we can't, I think, we, we didn't know each other as well back then. Like we'd gotten to know each other over the phone, but I think that was when we both realized that we had very similar personalities because in both of True. our minds, there was no way we were not going to go in. Like we had to Never. go in now. We wouldn't have broken the down the door, but the door blew open. So that felt like an invitation of sorts. So we went inside and it was, it was pretty cre creepy. I think both of us were kind of hoping to maybe have a greater understanding of the restaurant and the layout. And I think we got that, but it, you know, it looked quite different because it had been turned into a payday loan office. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we went back. I don't know if we told you this, <laughs> but we went back. We kept going back that week to kind of see and be like, Oh, maybe we'll, I don't know. We're just, we're just weirdos. So we kept going back <laughs> and then um, we got there one time and I noticed that things smelled a little bit different and there was more trash on the floor. So I figured some teens have gotten in here and were partying and they don't know what the building was. So they felt comfortable mm -hmm. doing that. Then we actually walked into one of the rooms and somebody had set up like a little encampment there. So there was actually a homeless person living there. <laughs> so we got out of there really quickly. <laughs> and that was the last time we ever went in there. <laughs> That's that's crazy. I, I I sent you guys a message a while ago that I I uh, had talked to a psychic, um, and uh, she this lady is from Indiana, by the way, Kevin, mm -hmm. and uh, she uh, had told me when I when I first talked to her, um, know, probably about a year ago, that she had been involved in several uh, true crime cases and have you know worked with uh, local and regional and and federal um, crime organizations. Mm -hmm. And um, and I asked her, I was like, uh, have you heard of the Burger Chef murders from the late 70s in Indianapolis? And she said that she vaguely remembered hearing about it, you know, being from Indiana. And um, I said, well, what do you think about it? You know, and first thing that she told me without skipping a beat, she took just a few seconds and she said it was an inside job. That was the first thing that she said. But, you know, you can take that however you want. But um, you know, we're talking about supernatural stuff. So um, let, let's uh, let's go on to another question here from uh, some of your listeners for episode number one, which was entitled The Night. Uh, if George Nichols went inside the Burger Chef that night for matches, did he get them from one of the employees or some unknown person? Yeah, we thought this was a really good question, because if if it was someone not wearing a Burger Chef uniform, maybe that's an additional sighting of the perpetrator. I think our sure. understanding is that it was likely Danny Davis who gave George the matches that night. He said it was a okay. young man who was white and wearing a Burger Chef uniform. So okay. we, we believe that was likely. And, Danny. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. And um, now they, they made these busts out of clay of uh, the clean shaven guy and the bearded guy, uh, the two main suspects back in 1978. Um, were the busts or the sketches of the of the suspects accurate in your opinion? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so the busts to me don't really look like people. They look like an alien's approximation of a person. And that that's no disrespect to the person who made them. I, I feel like they were probably doing their best with the information that they had, but I don't know. The busts are really scary to look at. If any if you have if you look up pictures, they're pretty um they're pretty freaky. What do you think? Am I being too harsh? No, I, I've seen the bus in person. They're pretty, pretty, pretty strange to see. Yeah, the I think we both have kind of a similar opinion of the the sketches, which is, you know, they're they're um they're helpful, you know, in in terms of maybe having having something to grasp onto, but they're problematic because they look like so many white guys in the 1970s. Like it's basically. Yeah. You could see these guys, frankly, walking down on the, the street in Brooklyn right now because it just looks like sure. a guy with a beard and a guy without a beard to me. And yeah, the guy with the beard. I mean, 
The guy, the guy with the beard looked like a, like a roadie for the Charlie Daniels band. I don't know. It just could have been. <laughs> he looks like, yeah, he looks like you could see him at any concert or any bar. It's 1978. Facial hair is huge. And it, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think um, by releasing the sketches, police kind of got an inundation of information about everybody who knew a bearded ne'er-do-well. Um, and it's like, I don't know how yeah. much helped but I, I i get why they did it because they they didn't have much to go on so it's complicated and by the way just to let you know just to let you know that i i was in a i was in a rock band in college and we were called the bearded near dwells <laughs> we were good you we were, were very good <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, what the heck was the deal with donald forrester uh he was all over the newspapers for years um do you guys think he was the killer what was going on with him I think we we're like very careful. We're very diplomatic, but I think we we don't want to rule anyone out entirely because mm -hmm. there's might be stuff in the file that we don't know about. But yeah. I would say my opinion is he was not involved at this. No, point. no, no. He made too many uh, basic factual errors about the crime scene. Yeah. Uh, I think he was just manipulating uh, the system to try to. Uh, be kept in the Marion County Jail instead of being transferred up to uh, Indiana State Prison up at uh, Michigan City, which is a very tough place to be. I will say, though, I think that he may have killed people because I think he was a very dangerous human being. And I would say, like, if there's any, like, missing women in the areas where he was in, people should be people should be considering, like, him because he was he was really okay. bad dude. Yeah, he was. Um, let me ask you guys a question. Uh, well, this is a question from your, from your, um, from your listeners, but I also thought about this too. I was like a little bit worried about you guys, um, during this whole thing. Did you ever have any type of threat? Did you ever feel like, like maybe you were in danger? Did anybody ever threaten you or anything? Yes. So, <laughs> next question. No, 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 no. We got to We got to engage with it more than that. <laughs> I, 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 I've never. I'm, I don't never feel like I never I don't think we were ever in serious danger in this. We had a few uncomfortable moments. There were some very uncomfortable moments with people who we were talking to who you felt maybe, you know, maybe uh, maybe they are involved or that's a question. You know, we, like we went to there. We talked about the person who threw the gun out the car window who was stopped by the police. Yeah. We tried to find him. We couldn't find him, but we did find one of his close friends. And that gentleman was not very happy to uh, see us. And well, that was kind of threatening. That was a little scary. Um, it's like, I guess it's a lot of it's from maybe not knowing people. And like, obviously, if you go to someone's door and say, hey, do you know this guy? We think he might have uh, maybe we have some questions about the Burger Chef murders. Most people are probably gonna be like, what the hell? Get out of here. But like, there was, you know, maybe something a little scary about the vibe there. Uh, he, he was very angry and yelling and kind of, uh, I think maybe the time I felt most <laughs> uncomfortable is uh, there was a person who was heavily involved in the drug trade in- uh, <laughs> I know it, yeah. <laughs> in indiana back did you, talk to, did you talk to him in person or on the phone or no, we we, we we showed up at his place of business and Un kind of, unannounced 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 yeah. oh man and he was not very happy to see us and there was just kind of a quiet feeling of menace and dread about it and i remember afterwards you were very very concerned and felt i should buy a home security system <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, I was. yeah yeah you guys are dealing with some some heavy people. Um, speaking of heavy people, Tim Willoughby. Now, that's a name that I heard. If Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, when you guys spoke with uh, another fellow podcaster and fellow stand-up comedian, uh, Todd Todd McComas. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Is that where the name is? That where the name kept coming up in that one in that um, episode? I think we talked a bit about him. It, we we he kind of gets sprinkled everywhere, but he was more in the the Alan Pruitt episodes. He uh, was a man who went missing. And some mm -hmm. people think he was murdered uh, and a murder victim himself. And then other people think he was uh, actually could have been the perpetrator of this or even other murders. So he's kind of a mysterious figure. So it's unclear. You know, he, could, he could still be alive out there or he could have been uh, murdered yeah. in June of 1978. 
Um, I, you know, this next question is, uh, again, uh, <laughs> um, about the Speedway Police Department. Um, do you feel as though they did their best to, um, you know, figure this case out? Do you think that they sort of swept it under the rug and just kind of like said, yeah, there's nothing here and just walked away? Or do you think they knew something and didn't want to like get involved? Yeah, it's a great question because there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there that sort of say the police, they they may have covered it up or something in Speedway. And I think, you know, I'm I'm not gonna lie, I'm I'm always open to information about, you know, whatever. I'll I'll if it's a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy theory, I'll I'll still look mm-hmm. into it. I'd say like I don't think I don't think there's any evidence that the Speedway police did anything other than bungle this because they made bad choices and they didn't have a very good detective responding to the scene. We've, we've since learned that he was um, a uh, an alcoholic who like killed a woman with his car later on and had to be kind of forced off the, the force, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, so I think, I don't think you should, I think in general, it's probably a decent idea to not attribute to malice what you could to incompetence. And I think Speedway seemed like there was a lot going on there. I'll say that Speedway seemed like a hot bed of drug activity from what we can tell. And there seemed to be something off in the town, but could you Mm -hmm. say that the Speedway police were corrupt? No, I don't think there's, I don't think, I think they were not prepared to deal with something of this magnitude. And I think the man who specifically bungled the crime scene had a lot going on in his life and should not have been a police officer at that point. And I'd like to stress that the Speedway Police Department now is a completely different oh, yeah. organization. It's much more professional, much better run. Yeah. Uh, they, they were just a bunch of small town people back in the day who didn't have much experience mm-hmm. with uh, major crime. I've been told it was not unusual for the person on duty to man the phones at Speedway on a Friday night to not even get a single call all night long. And I'll say that, you know, I think it's not, they're not an uncommon kind of police force in 1978. If you listen to true crime podcasts, you've probably heard about similar cases where it was the seventies and the cops said, Hey, she probably just ran away, even though, you know, so I think that's a, they're not an unusually this was not necessarily un, an unusually uh, out of the blue bad response. It was kind of garden variety incompetence. Yeah. The last episode that you guys just had, I think it's called the remembrance. Um, and um, besides getting to interview you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan, by the way. Um, I wanted to uh, just touch upon something that I asked you guys when I originally um, interviewed you last month. Uh, and that was, do you think that there will ever be any type of Netflix uh, series or document documentary? And I and I think, Kevin, you mentioned something about some Australian uh, gentleman that might be uh, starting to produce one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's a, a crew from uh, Australia who a couple of years ago uh, came over and spent a couple of weeks going around talking to as many witnesses as they could. This is a man named Adam Camion, and uh, his uh, a partner is Luke Grinderman. Uh, they were planning to come back, uh, I believe, last year, but you know, COVID happened, so it, yeah. it, it, that's kind of up in the air. And uh, is there anything else going on? I mean, I think it's one of those things. Uh, it's it's almost a hard case to tackle as a as a documentary because there's so much to it. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's no there's no concrete plans on on anything but i i would say just as a if anyone's listening it's it's definitely a very um rich case to look into because it's unsolved it's uh it's had this horrible impact and um there's you know there's indications that it's no matter what theory you think is the the right theory there's so much to mine here there's so many different possibilities and i i think i think um people who care about justice and people who care about true crime would be interested in, in hearing him hearing more about a case like this. Yeah. We agree with you. I, I think it'd make yeah. a great documentary. I think it would make a really good documentary, like a series where you could like maybe break down, like we tried to do it like by theory, but I think you could probably break it down in a number of ways. Oh yeah. Um, now getting back to your listeners questions. Uh, somebody asked if they thought, uh, 
Mark Flemons uh, really died from running into a tree. Yeah, this has been one of those things that I, I've kind of gone back and forth on because I think that sounds kind of ridiculous on its, you know, like from the outset, like that just seems like something that wouldn't happen in real life. Um, mm-hmm. we, we, we've under, we've since kind of like, uh, understood like the nature of his injuries are a bit unusual. Um, I don't, I have a hard time imagining that that's the case, but I guess, I don't know. What we do can't, you, we can't, dismiss we can't, it. we can't dismiss it. Um, but I think that would, I don't know. It's one of those cases, unfortunately, because the forensic abilities were not what they are now you know, perhaps they could have cleared up that question if this case happened today by testing the tree and doing analysis. But yeah, it seems hard to believe. But at the same time, this whole case is kind of hard to believe. How do you guys think that they um, uh, got the uh, the four kids uh, from uh, from the burger shop out to Johnson County it was a like what a 30 or 40 minute trip, right? Yeah, this there's been it's it's interesting. It's like that's we don't even know what route they took. I mean, it's it's that open ended. Um, I think the key thing that I remember when I think about that is like the Jane's car, which was found, which had been parked in the Burger Chef parking lot, but was later found in a uh, a, a, a near park in Speedway near this police station. Um, that was not taken out to Johnson County. That that it didn't, the speedometer Mm -hmm. wouldn't support that. So it, it, whatever happened, it seems to me like they were transported to a vehicle or Jane was forced to drive to a vehicle and she was brought back to the restaurant and then they were transported from there. Like one of those two things had to have happened. And Pruitt said he saw a van that night. So it's possible they had a van that they, they loaded them into and used that to transport them. Uh, also, I don't recall if we mentioned this on the podcast or not, but about the same time as the kids were being abducted from the burger chef at the shopping center across the street, somebody stole a station wagon, which was recovered the next day in the downtown areas of Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. So it's possible that that station wagon was stolen for the express purpose of transporting the kids. Yeah. It, and it's, it's so frustrating that we don't even, we can't even say we know for sure what vehicle was used in this crime because you have a lot of stuff, people talking about vans, which makes sense when you're transporting a large group of people, but it's not, it's not necessarily a van. So um, another question from your listeners, uh, they would like to know um, who investigated the case after the large task force was disbanded. Yeah, that's a great, that is a great question. Cause it's like, it attracted this huge outpouring of law enforcement resources at first. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Indiana State Police sort of took point on this case for the most part. Um, and in the immediate years after the task force went away, it was, uh, I guess, primarily Donovan Lindsay, who's unfortunately since passed away. Um, and then Jim Kramer, who is, uh, you hear his voice on our podcast um, and who featured in the article that I wrote for Insider. Um, and they were, he was kind of, they were kind of, helping each other out, but there were a lot of different state police um, officers working on the case and working on different leads Um, and even different uh, other jurisdictions like the Marion County Sheriff's Department. They were really big into the Forrester lead. Then after uh, Kramer and Donovan Lindsay uh, retired, the case at the state police level was taken over by a detective named Stoney Van, and then he retired a couple of years back. And so the current detective in charge is uh, Bill Dalton with the ISP. Yes. So the ISP is still, still looking into it. And it's, a, it's an open case. A couple of follow-up questions that I had um, myself uh, for you guys that um, I didn't get to ask uh, the first time I interviewed you uh, uh, was, um, did you read the book? There was a book written by a lady a few years ago uh, about this uh, whole case. Yes. Yes. Is it is it good or is it just a series of articles that she kind of compiled? <laughs> it, it's basically uh, she went through newspapers.com and she read all of the newspaper coverage of the case and wrote it up as a book. Okay. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you guys um, that I, I still like the uh, the letter 
the anonymous letter that you guys talked about that was written to the local Indianapolis uh, newspaper. And um, whoever wrote it said that they, you know, knew who one of the people were that were involved and they're very afraid to come forward. And um, can, can you elaborate on that letter a little bit more? Is there anything else that you know about it or? I've always found that letter very fascinating and very credible. I, I just wish there was more detail to it because yeah. it is, it, it sounds credible, but there's just, it, it's just also vague enough that you could imagine that it's talking about Forrester. You can imagine it's talking about Tim Willoughby or a number of different people. Uh, this person wrote a letter to the police and to the media saying they had this information that uh, it was a group of three people who committed this crime. And the third person who was involved did not know <laughs> it was going to be a murder. And that when they got out to the murder site and the shooting began, this third person was shocked and yelled, run. At which point the third person was himself himself or herself uh, beaten up. And this, this letter writer said, if you give me immunity and give this third person immunity, they will come forward with what they know. And the police held, you know, made a press statement saying, we've received this letter and we'll give immunity. And the person wrote back and said, uh, I can't do it. I, I gave this person my word and it just went away after that. I'll say like we've heard, I mean, we can't talk too much about this because it's something we're looking into, but we've heard from some people where they say, oh, this is this is the third party or this is the person they were referring to. So like it definitely still comes up in terms of people saying, I know the identity of the 812 uh, writer. Yeah, just a few weeks ago, we got uh, a tip from somebody who they say knows, knows who wrote the letter. So we are looking into that. Yeah, it, it's one of those things. It's so frustrating because it really does convey something that sort of makes sense and, and sort of seems kind of credible, but there's no evidence backing it. There's no, uh, you know, there's no like, okay, this is definitely true because they mentioned a detail that nobody knows. Like it could have... It's it's vagueness is so um, frustrating, but also kind of but something about it rings true. Yeah, something about it does ring true. And I've I've often thought to me that Burger Chef, if we think about how fast food crimes typically play out, Burger Chef to me strikes me as like some of the perpetrators knew this was going to be a murder and some people involved perhaps didn't and perhaps were going along with it thinking that the kids were going to be left out in the woods. That makes that makes a, 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 an emotional sense to me in a way. And then and, you um, so easy okay. to start, start speculating and stuff. And the person who wrote this letter, when they refer to the third person at the crime scene, they never use any pronouns. Yeah, they could be a she. They, they could be saying that a woman was the third person. And you wonder if there was a woman at the scene, is that one of the reasons why people went along willingly? Because they, if a woman is there, maybe we're not going to get hurt. And that letter, holy cow. When you guys read that letter, I just sat there and uh, just everything about this case, every, so many people came so close so many times. It's just so frustrating. Uh, here's another question from uh, one of your listeners. Um, are there any theories that you guys did not include in your podcast? Uh, yes, I would say yes. I mean, there's a lot of theories out there. We tried to pick the ones that there's the most information on where we could really do an episode on it and convey information that then people can can have that's either been put out in the press or put out by police um, and has some backing to it. Uh, but there's, I mean, I'll say this seems sometimes when you look into this case, it feels a bit like everybody has a suspect, <laughs> like where you have like people being like, well, my my stepdad was a real abusive asshole and I am going to, you know, I'm, I'll tell you that he came back with bloody clothes one night and you're like, oh my goodness. You know, like, it's like every, everybody seems to, like, if somebody was like a bad guy in the Indianapolis area at that time, it feels like there's stories about the person. I'm exaggerating, but like, not by much, I feel. There's lots of wild stories. There's a story where, uh, a man overheard his daughter and her uh, husband to be arguing. And she said, if you, if you're not careful, I'll get mad enough to tell the police all about what you did at Burger Chef. 
at which point the uh, husband uh, freaked out and left and cut the phone lines of the house. <laughs> and I don't think I don't think it's a situation where people are making stuff up to get attention. I think that it's possible that somebody who's a huge jerk could say something like, oh, I did Burger Chef to scare the people around him, even if they were lying. But like, I, it, it feels like you have a lot of stories like that. Well, that that uh, very first um, it wasn't I don't think it was your guys show It's another show. Um, they were actually doing uh, reenactments on this podcast. It was pretty impressive. But um, there's 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 a situation. I think it was the night after the kids went missing. So they went missing on Friday. Right. And then I think the next night there was some guy in some bar around there, like uh, shooting his mouth off and talking about like, you know, how, um, you know, he knows exactly what happened and he knows where the kids are. And I mean, that's, that, that sort of just kind of like fluttered away, you know, like that whole thing was just like, why would he talk about all this stuff? And then, it, it, but you do think that he was just trying to like get a little attention. huh? Well, that was actually the robbery gang guy. So he's, he's part of one of the big theories on this. The, the Rob, he was the guy who was involved in a robbery gang where they were going around and robbing burger chefs at the same time. Um, as, uh-huh. the, as this was going on and he, uh, did we name him? I think we did. I think we did. Cause he's dead. He, that, that was David Cathcart. And he, um, he since died. He, uh, I think he died by suicide. This person died by suicide, allegedly by cutting his own throat. Yeah, so he kind of died under weird circumstances. Frankly. Kind of a strange way to die. Yeah, but yeah. He, so, anyways, he he he's um he's kind of a big player in this because he is the start of this major robbery gang theory that was put mm-hmm. forward by Stony Van and is still put forward by Todd McComas, who we had on the show. We had a great conversation with him, and I think the robbery gang theory is pretty credible. I'm not I'm not wedded to it, but there's a lot there. Unfortunately, it's all like circumstantial. There's not quite enough to prove or disprove it for me, but there's enough there to make you really think, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. And um, there was another one. There was a person who killed some pe- who killed the manager of McDonald's in Indianapolis. He got him into a storage locker at the McDonald's and shot him to death. And he was convicted of that crime. And it turned out that he went to the same church as Mark Fleming's parents. So one of the victims in the Burger Chef case. So there's an investigator on this case who wonders and has speculated to us, maybe this person also did Burger Chef and that turned into a murder because he was recognized by Mark Fleming's. So there's a lot, we just kind of winnowed it out to the, uh, yeah, the biggest theories, the ones that we find most. And credible. I, I think we're willing to revisit it in future episodes, even of you never can forget if we find more on stuff and and kind of are, are able to piece something together where we feel like we can present it in a responsible way. Yeah, you guys did a great job. Um, like I said, I'm I'm a fan, and uh, I'm just uh, thrilled that you asked me to do this. Oh, thank um, you for doing it, Matt. We're fans of you too. Oh, I, my, my journalism, uh, uh, you know, um, my whole journalism thing ended in college when I wrote for the University of Maryland's uh, newspaper. That was about it. What about Tom Brokaw? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I got Tom Brokaw's coffee and bagels for three months, four months. You fueled an important journalist. <laughs> what? You fueled an important journalist. So there you go. I did. I did. And I got his uh, his assistant. Uh, I got her uh, a lot of uh, key lime pie, too. On my oh, so very important stuff. Uh, but uh, OK, so now that uh, another question from your listeners, now that you can never forget, which is the name of your series regarding uh, Burger Chef is over with. Um, are you guys going to be sort of just uh, letting go of the whole Burger Chef thing for a while and moving on to something else? We're kind of like, we'll never let go of Burger Chef. Um, it, it be, and, you know, and I don't know, it's it's hard to let go of. Uh, in terms of episodes, we're going to, we're not going to be, you know, I, we're going to be basically transitioning um, into sort of a crime of the week format uh, where we'll be discussing different fast food and restaurant crimes each week and doing a very in-depth kind of investigative dive into them. Um, and then we're actually going to do, we have a few uh, other mini series planned. Um, that where we'll be tackling something in in a longer format, just like we did with Burger Chef. We we anticipate that there may be updates to give in the Burger Chef case at some point in the future. 
in fact, we have a Freedom of Information Act request in with the FBI. The FBI actually investigated the Bergeshev case briefly. And when we get those files from them in a few months, uh, it's very possible there'll be something in there that'll be worth uh, discussing. It's also possible that there'll be nothing of worth in there. So it's not a guarantee uh, of anything, but it's certainly a possibility. Um, and so, you know, we're going to we're going to keep up. We're going to keep on Burger Chef in the background. But um, I think we've we, we feel like we've covered it in depth and given people a pretty good um, sense of the general outline of the case, I think. I know I sent you a message about him, but I just want to make sure that you guys follow up about this. Uh, this uh, um, guy, his name is Kenneth Maines. I think I told you about him. Yeah, the profiler. Have you heard of him? Yeah. Did you guys ever hear of him or? Yeah, have you? Uh, yeah, I have. Yeah, I, I believe he was on some shows that I, I've seen in, uh, in the true crime space. He's, he's a pretty interesting guy. And I, I don't I mean, I, I actually reached out to him. Um, and uh, but uh, yeah, he's he's got like a whole Facebook presence and Facebook page and uh, Kenneth Maines and Ken Maines dot com. And OK, and um, could be could be something that you guys could collaborate or get together with him, just, you know putting that out there. So I'd be really curious um, to see what he said about like um to, to get his thoughts on maybe like a profile of what how a crime like this could play out because I've I've talked about this but I feel like fast food murders tend to happen in the restaurant. So it's really unusual that Burger Chef happened 20 miles away. And so yeah. I would be curious if he if a profiler like that might have insight onto okay well here's what might happen to cause that basically. Sure. Um, another question for you from your listeners: uh, What is next for the murder sheet? Well, we've got some cases in the pipeline that we're we're going to keep on doing episodes on restaurant murders because we think that's kind of an interesting genre of crime to take on of like. A lot of crime, unfortunately, happens at restaurants. So we're just looking into some of those. We'll be um, we'll be doing one case that looks really similar to Burger Chef that happened in Florida in uh, 1975, where you had a group of employees kidnapped and murdered. Yeah, miles. Really? Yeah, it looks weird. It looks weirdly similar. Most of the police we've mm-hmm. talked to do not think they were related, and I'm I'm willing to say that they're probably correct. But it's just unusual. Some of the uh, the hallmarks of the Burger Chef crime kind of seem to happen there too. Yeah, for, there was a couple of days we were really. Uh, yeah, there was a wondering. couple of days where I was like, "We solved the case, we solved the case, we did it," and I was like spiking the football. And then we talked to a bunch of investigators, and they were all like, "You guys are idiots." No, they, <laughs> they, <laughs> they didn't say that, but they were they were nice about it. But they were like, "We don't really think they're related." And I'm like, "You know what? Yeah, I can." So we we went back down to earth, but um, it is it is unusually similar in some respects. Um, and what what other what are the cases that we cover in? Uh, there's a case in Hawaii. There's this bizarre missing murder, missing persons case where uh, the prosecution's key witness had a nervous breakdown on the stand. It's like something out of Perry Mason. So that's kind of wild. And we've we wow. talked to some of the attorneys in that case. Uh, we have a, a case that's kind of a little bit, I'm, I'm not going to say, I don't want to spoil it, but it's, I'll just say it's a weirdly uplifting story of felony murder. <laughs> that sounds really wrong, but it, it kind of is. It's a kind of a story about, we didn't know we were getting into um, it as we were reporting it, but we um, mm-hmm. talked to some people and it's really a story about like redemption and uh, okay. a one man going from being a criminal to kind of something else so it that was kind of neat there's actually uh, a couple of cases from the chicago area one Mm. which is uh we think is a pretty strong case of a wrongful conviction in a restaurant homicide case and we've been talking a lot with the attorneys on that case and they've given us a lot of documents that uh that'll probably be another mini series yeah that'll be another mini was that was it a recent one is that uh Uh, this was in the late 90s but the person is still in prison and, okay, uh, no, no, it's not the brown brown chicken. Uh, oh no, 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 no. And I think it's pretty uh, a pretty strong no. person being in. So okay, well that was going to be the next question. What are your future uh, mini series going to be? But I guess you guys just kind of answer. So okay. what are you guys going to pick up? Are you guys going to take a break for a while? Are you gonna are you going to go right into a new one? Or? We're gonna we're gonna just launch right into it. We're gonna keep publishing on Tuesdays, uh, and uh, mm-hmm. just uh, keep at it. I guess. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna. Uh, 
I don't even know when we're going to, I don't know if we have any breaks planned at this point. <laughs> uh, we're, we're pretty obsessive. We're pretty obsessive. And we, we were starting another podcast because we're nuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're we're going to, but it's kind of a nice way to blow off steam because this is a lot of, you know, pretty depressing stuff. The worst part of humanity, people hurting each other. So we yeah. have decided uh, we're going to start uh, watching kind of mystery movies and kind of talking about them. So that'll be a nice way to you know release some stress around all this mystery movies like uh, can you give me an example of what you're talking about what well, uh... we're taking a very broad view of what mystery means so we're doing everything from like thrillers to like uh film noir to like old crime films to like uh mm-hmm. you know murder mysteries detective stories um police procedurals basically nancy drew nancy drew ever anything um anything that kind of has a mystery element we're kind of including that we're very uh very loosey-goosey with our genre conventions here well if you guys ever ever do any uh jfk stuff let me know because i'm obsessed with that stuff and uh but let's get back to uh, the murder sheet so uh we we're gonna we're gonna get some new ones from you guys some new episodes yep we're just gonna keep up you know so just check if you subscribe to us just check your feed we'll be putting them up uh you know we're not taking any breaks (laughs) (laughs) because we're crazy because we're nuts All right. Well, Anya and Kevin, thank you so much for uh, letting me do this. I was going to say, you guys get back to work. (laughs) There you go. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. It was great talking to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet Presents. You never can forget. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast or by searching Murder Sheet. For exclusive content like bonus episodes and case files, become a patron of the Murder Sheet on Patreon at patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you enjoyed listening to the Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. Before you go, please stick around to hear from our friend Nina from the Already Gone podcast, a great show you should definitely be checking out. I first learned about the Burger Chef murders from her 2016 episode on the case. Murder, missing persons, unsolved mysteries. Already Gone explores lesser-known cases from Michigan and the Great Lakes region. I'm Nina Instead, the voice behind the Already Gone podcast. Join me for an in-depth look at stories that will have you looking over your shoulder and locking the doors at night. Find Already Gone on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcatcher.